Okay, we're live. Good afternoon, web shadowers. Thank you all for attending our session this afternoon. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Schertz, who will be teaching us about pediatric gastroenterology. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments at the end of the live stream, and it will be in the description as well. So with that being said, Dr. Schertz, you may start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, good afternoon, y'all. Um, thank you, Web Shadowers, for having me. This is my second time presenting now. Um, I presented in the fall, and so we'll talk a little bit about my story, um, but I will, if you want to know more, definitely go back to that. Um, so my name is Dr. Joanna. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, um, and if you have any other questions after this regarding um, mentoring, uh, medical school, residency, pediatrics, gastroenterology, send me a message. Um, you can definitely um, message me directly on Instagram or, um, or, you know, or let me know after this, I'll be reading all the comments afterwards too. So um, today we'll be talking about caustic ingestions in foreign bodies. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic because this happens a lot. And um, this is something that us pediatric gastroenterologists encounter very frequently. So, um, um, you know, I want y'all to be aware and know what to do um, if this happens to someone you know. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, all of these are examples. Um, no real patient information is used. And nothing I discussed during this presentation um, is representation of my employer. So I'll do a little backstory. Um, um, I was born in Poland. I um, came to the United States for the very first time when I, when I was one and a half years old. And then, um, and then I went back and forth from the United States back to Poland for half a year at a time up until I was in high school. So high school was the first time I was in the United States full time. Um, and after high school, um, I went to Northwestern University for undergrad. I studied biology and anthropology. Um, and I also played a uh, division one sport. And so it was busy. I think that my biggest advice for y'all is um, to really plan, 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 plan. Um, know what to expect when you're taking your tests, know when you're taking your, um, your classes that you're going to need for your MCAT. You know, this, these are all really important things. I didn't take my MCAT until senior year. Um, so I had a decision. I could either take a year off or I could find another place that I could apply to. And thankfully, I was able to apply to Poznań, which is in Poland. Um, it is close to my family. Um, and so I was able to, um, I had about a month to apply after my test scores came back um, and I was thankfully accepted. And so what I want y'all to know is that you're never really prepared for what's going to happen in five to 10 years. I mean, um, the honest truth is, is you will have more challenges if you go to a foreign medical school for med, for, um, for med school. Um, and there are some things that you are going to have to figure out. So things, if you want to come back to the States, for example, you really need to work on test scores. You really need to do that extra research. You really need to make yourself competitive. And so I'm not saying it's not doable. I just think that you, if you prepare yourself to doing that, um, you need to know that it will, you know, you'll have to keep working hard. Um, and so the great thing about Poznan was that it mirrored a lot of the medical schools um, in the United States. And so when that came to like my MBME uh, testing, when it came to prep for all my step board exams, um, they had Kaplan come in and teach a live course over the summer for us. And so it that part was really great. Um, it was an English program too. And so, you know, that uh, prepared me for, for exams then, and then um, for the application process. Um, and so I went to, went, came back to the United States and I did my residency, my pediatric residency in Tennessee. 
Um, and so that was, I always knew I wanted to go into pediatrics. That was um, a no brainer for me. And then really through residency was I, did I fall in love with gastroenterology? And so what I found myself is every specialty uh, rotation that I was doing or general pediatric rotation, I was kind of always drawn to that GI aspect. So I always really cared about the feedings that the kiddos were on, the feeding tubes, um, the GI diseases, the surgical um, associated GI disease. And so I was, I found pediatric gastroenterology as my top interest really early on. So that part was great. Um, uh, okay, so we'll jump in. If you have more questions about this, let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to y'all uh, more about kind of my journey and um, and what happened. And then, so after residency, I did gastroenterology at Emory um, in Atlanta, and I'm currently practicing um, in Georgia. I'm in academic medicine. So when you are an attending, you can choose between private practice or academics. I decided to stay in academics. Um, I think it's quite wonderful. Um, within GI, you can do a lot of things. So you have clinic and you have procedures. Some of the procedures we'll talk about today that we do. Um, but then in academics, it's wonderful too, because you um, can do more research, you can do a lot of teaching. So I do a lot of mentoring for med students, um, residents and fellows. Um, and so it keeps it busy, keeps it interesting. Um, and so that's, that's my journey um, in a nutshell. So on Friday, I believe it was, I sent out some pre quiz questions um, and I'll show y'all what uh, we had people answer. Um, so there were over 800 people that answered. So this first question was, what was the, is the most common ingested foreign body in kids? And so the right answer was coins um, and about 500 people got that right. Um, and if you think about it, it's, you know, um, it's something we have around the house, we have in the car, we have in our pockets, we have in our jackets. And so that is primarily why coins are the most common um, ingested foreign body in kiddos. And then um, what is the most dangerous ingested foreign body? So um, all of these are, are seem scary, right? Um, magnets and nails and safety pins, especially because they're very sharp. But um, the right answer here was a button battery. And so about 390 people um, got that right. Now, magnet was a little bit of a tricky um, um, answer because I, I meant like one magnet. Um, if you have multiple magnets, that is extremely dangerous as well. So we will go through that and why that is um, um, emergent and dangerous. Uh, foreign body to ingest. And so what is the most common place for a foreign body to get stuck? So if it gets stuck, I'm not saying it always will, majority of the time it won't get stuck. And majority of the time, um, you know, you ingest or someone ingests a foreign body, it will pass through the GI tract. But if it is to be stuck, the esophagus is the most common place. And I'll show y'all why that is um, in the next few slides. And so definitely the majority of folks got this right, um, which is awesome. So one thing that we do want to do is do a review of um, anatomy. So before we jump into the basics of foreign bodies, where they get stuck and why, um, we need to go through basic GI anatomy. I'm not sure if y'all can see um, can you respond and tell me, can you see my pointer um, on the group chat? Oh, okay, great, awesome. Okay, so this is the mouth, right? Um, this is the esophagus, that is the feeding tube. That is where everything passes. Um, and after the, esoph the esophagus runs very closely with respiratory um, organs too. So there, the trachea is right next to it. Um, and so it kind of lines it as well. Um, and so the esophagus food travels through here and into the stomach. Um, the food gets digested in the stomach and then it passes into the small intestine. 
And this part of the small intestine right here, the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And you can see that it kind of has that C loop, um, which is another place that things can get stuck. And so we'll talk about which things can get stuck there um, in a little bit. And so then, so it's in the small intestine, there are three different type uh, parts of the small intestine. And what's kind of gnarly is um, the small intestine is quite long. So we have anywhere, we adults have anywhere from 10 to 16 feet of small intestine. So if you were to take that small intestine out and um, stretch it out, it would, it would span 10 to 16 feet, which is quite large. And so what happens in the small intestine is a lot of nutrients get absorbed and different nutrients get absorbed in different parts of the small intestine. And then the small intestine connects to the large intestine. So the colon is the large intestine, this green structure right here. And there is a connection here. That's another common place for food or for foreign bodies to get stuck is that connection between the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, and so um, the primary objective or goal of the colon is to take water out of that liquid um, that comes into the colon. And as water gets taken out, that's what makes stool more hard. And so as it passes through the colon here, it gets stored in the rectum um, and that's the muscle storage compartment for all of our stool. And then once you're ready to stool, there sends a signal to your brain that says we need to empty and you have a bowel movement. So that is the GI anatomy in a nutshell. All right, so um, here are a few things, a few um, chief complaints that we can see in the clinic. Um, these are the most common. Um, the last talk we talked about was constipation and reflux. Um, and so, so we can also see anything from weight loss to weight gain or failure to thrive, meaning that the weight gain is so poor that kiddos need extra help, abdominal pain, um, diarrhea, vomiting, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease. You can see a lot of liver disease as well on here too. So in GI, we don't just cover the GI tract, um, what's called the luminal GI tract. Um, but we also, we also, um, take care of the liver. We take care of the pancreas. Um, so there are a lot of organs involved. And then today we're going to talk about foreign bodies. So what are caustic ingestions? We're going to just jump right in. We're going to talk about two different types of, uh, big categories of foreign bodies. Um, so caustic ingestions and then foreign bodies. And so a caustic ingestion is something that is accidentally or deliberately ingested by somebody. Um, and it really depends on the pH of the substance to know um, how dangerous it can be. So the two main pHs to know are if something is strongly acidic, so a pH less than two, or if something is strongly basic, so a pH greater than 11.5. Those are the two numbers. If you remember two and 12, so that's also a good way to remember. But um, once you're definitely getting into that 11.5 range, um, nearing 12, that is uh, very dangerous. And so there were over 2 million exposures in 2016 alone. Um, majority of these kiddos were less than five years old. And that makes sense, right? Because majority of these are accidental. So kids don't know. And if you have things that are um, available for kids to get into, that's what happens. Um, so majority are less than five years old, but even less than 12 years old, that is primarily accidental. And then usually a, um, greater than 13 um, is when we see things like intentional ingestions, self-harm um, or suicide attempts. So what's the most frequently ingested, what are the most frequently ingested products? So cosmetic, right? Makeup really? Well, um, it's not surprising that this category is the most common. Um, things like toothpaste and hair care products and mouthwashes, 
um, nail products, hand sanitizer, soap. These are all things that are uh, readily available. And so they're available on, um, they're left on dressers, they're left in the bathroom counters. They are things that are underneath, you know, in, in counters that kids can open and get into. And so that's when it becomes a problem. Now, remember those pHs. So not all things that are ingested are going to cause that severe problem, um, but they can definitely in, in whatever amount cause vomiting, diarrhea, irritation to little ones. Um, and so even ingestion, not just to the mouth, but to the eyes that can happen as well. Um, and so then, so that's why these are the most common things. And then we have household cleaners, um, which accounted for about 11% of the ingestions. Um, and then we also have things like pain medication, um, Tylenol, ibuprofen, which was about 9%. Um, and so one particular thing that poison control um, has been monitoring over the last, you know, five-ish years um, are really those tied laundry pods. Um, you know, they kind of have that candy-like appearance um, that can, um, you know, that's like a toddler magnet in itself. Like toddlers are just uh, drawn to that. And they can have some serious effects when ingested, um, including that vomiting, the choking, breathing issues. Um, so those are the most frequently ingested things. And then this, uh, these are the most frequently, um, not, not just frequently ingested, but most um, uh, common divided into the two basic and acidic um, things. So um, alkaline agents were number one. Um, and why are they more common? Well, because they're tasteless. So that's the problem is when a toddler or um, you know a kiddo gets into it, they can drink quite a bit of this before a parent notices um, and before they feel sick. And so household bleach accounted for 36.6% of these alkaline or basic ingestions. But what's interesting is not all bleach pushes that pH of, um, you know, 11.5 or 12. So some are, some are, some are more safe or might cause more or less um, injury, but you don't know, right? We don't know what um, brand has what pH right away. So that's a problem. Oven cleaners, on the other hand, and here's kind of a list of all of them too. Oven cleaners, they have a pH that pushes 11 to 13. So these can really create severe injury. And then things like um, hair relaxers, you know, those are things that are um, basic that can cause injury as well. And then acidic ingestions. So these account for like more, less than 5% of the time, but that's because they taste bad. And so those don't really So if we're gonna remember one thing, um, we worry for anything that's basic above 11.5 pH or acidic less than two. Um, so those are the general guidelines. Um, so what do we as GI docs actually do when this happens? And so we'll talk about kind of management. We get called um, for these ingestions when the kiddos come into the urgent care or to the ER. And so depending on how sick the kiddo is, we typically wait about 12 to 48 hours after that ingestion happens to assess what that feeding tube, that esophagus looks like and to assess that damage. And that's usually because um, injury can happen with time. So if we assess it too quickly, for example, four hours after ingestion, we might not see the severe damage that can happen um, within like the first 12 hours. So we have a flexible, um, I call it a noodle when I talk to patients. Um, um, it, it has a camera and a light at the end of it like y'all can see right here. So the patient's asleep. We go through the mouth, down the esophagus. Um, I'll show you pictures of what the injuries can look like in the esophagus and into the stomach. And we can go as far as the first portion of that small intestine um, on regular scopes, which is that duodenum, that C loop right here that you see. And so why do we care, right? Like, why does this matter? Well, 
different pHs can cause different types of um, damage. So we need to know exactly, you know, what the what the ingested substance was, what was the concentration of it, um, what what was what form was it in? Was it a liquid? Was it a solid? Was it a gel? The amount of ingestion. Now that might be tough because by the time a parent brings the kiddo in, we don't know half the time, you know, how much was in that bottle or um, how much the kiddo took. So, so the esophageal um, uh, damage can cause be caused within a few hours or up to two, one to two days. And so the top pictures. Um, that is uh, caused by an acidic substance. So it causes a coagulation necrosis um, and an S-carb formation, which you can see that kind of dark formation, which might be some protection in it as well as it um, tends to kind of cover that um, mucosa. And then alkaline, so the basic are the bottom two pictures right here. And it's a liquefactive necrosis. And um, the problem with this one is that it can actually increase the depth of tissue injury. So we can go through the tissue into other parts um, of our body as it damages the esophagus. So what do we see, right? Like the, how do we know? And sometimes the patient is asymptomatic and sometimes, sometimes um, they have no symptoms and we have to go by what we think they took. And if we still need to watch them or observe them or we need to do the scope. And so um, the relationship between symptoms and severity is uncertain. Um, and so the most important things to look for, does the patient have any drooling, vomiting? Um, are they refusing to eat or drink? Um, do they have any abdominal pain? And some of these things may be really hard for a toddler to tell you. So you really have to do a careful physical exam. Do you, are, is there anything visible in the mouth um, that you can see? When the toddler is crying, um, are, they, is there, are their voice hoarse? Do they have strider? So it's this, <laughs> this type of um, inflammation that occurs um, in the upper respiratory tract area that is caused, that can be caused by these um, ingestions and dysphagia is trouble swallowing. So um, is there so much inflammation that they're not able to swallow water or um, if, you, they, if you give them something, you know, to eat at home, for example, before coming in. So the patient gets brought to the emergency room or um, the urgent care and a clinical assessment needs to be done. So a careful history um, trying to figure out what the substance was, then calling poison control or looking up the pH of it, um, trying to see the timing of it and really figure out, especially in that early teenage um, age group, was this intentional, was this accidental? Um, and sometimes that can be really, really hard. Um, doing a thorough um, exam, especially of that airway and listening to them is very, very important. Um, getting a good abdominal exam as well. And so you want to, so most folks do some labs to make sure that there is no um, renal failure, no liver problems happening, and then um, imaging. So the biggest thing we do is a chest x-ray to see, you know, if there's any um, notable um, inflammation that we can see. Um, there sometimes are concurrent ingestions, so sometimes um, kids will drink something and, and, you know, um, eat something like that's a foreign body, which we'll get into. So, um, sometimes we don't see anything. And so then we just have to go by the history, um, and decide if we need to perform that scope to look for the damage. And so GI's role, this is what we do. We perform the endoscopy, like I said, 12 to 48 hours after the ingestion, we really avoid, um, scoping, five to 15 days post the ingestion, that's when the esophagus is the weakest. Um, it has the highest rate of a perforation. And this is what we assess. So we look at what the mucosa, so what it looks like inside, um, and we grade it. And based on the grading, we can kind of tell a little bit more about um, what is the risk of problems in the future. And one of the biggest risks after an ingestion is what's called the stricture. So the damage is so so much My that apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, y'all. 
my Siri is listening in. Um, so, so sometimes the, um, the ingestion can be so severe that it actually causes narrowing or a stricture in that esophagus. And that can be seen many weeks or months after that ingestion. And so, for example, if you see one or two, um, the grading one or two, that might be a stricture risk of 5%. But when you get down to three or four, that stricture risk in the future might be 75 to 100%. And that middle picture is a contrast study. It's called an esophagram. And so that's when a patient um, swallows the contrast. And you can see in the middle here um, that narrowing that happened um, after an ingestion a while back. And so when that person is rescoped um, weeks to months later, that's the last picture. You can see that narrowing um, even before the scope is passed. Uh, and so those are all really important things because we can potentially help too uh, down the line. There are ways to treat these structures. Um, so that's really important too. Um, and so management. So we have to decide, is this a low risk product, right? Is the pH in that middle ground where we're okay to say that this is likely not gonna cause injury? Uh, what does the patient look like? Are they symptomatic? And that's important too, um, to know and, and to, you know, if they're not having any symptoms, then that doesn't mean that they might not develop them as time passes, but that might help with the decision to sending them home. Um, if they don't have anything in their, in their mouths and um, um, you know, you wanna clarify with poison, poison control is always called, um, and the problem, but and then, you know, they can be discharged home with close follow-up. Um, older children and adults can communicate better what they swallowed, where they feel pain, and they can kind of localize that. Um, localization is not reliable really. Um, so that's also um, important to know. And then younger kids really just, we can't depend on that. Um, and then concerns and clinical presentation, like we know, we talked about earlier, um, we usually admit the patient, we um, scope them and re we reassess them. If they have any respiratory failure, that is number one, that's always treated before GI even gets involved. Um, that is one of the most important things um, that the ER and in um, severe cases, if the child needs to go to the ICU, they'll take care of. Um, and then if there's an obstruction, so this is more so for those foreign bodies, like the actual objects that we'll talk about next. But if there's any um, signs of an obstruction in the abdomen or what's called an acute abdomen, then surgery needs to be consulted as well. And so um, that's GI's primary role um, um, in caustic ingestions. So next we'll go into foreign bodies. Um, and so there are all different types of things that kids can follow. Um, this is just a very short list of um, things. So coins uh, are number one things that they swallow. I'll show you all pictures of what they look like on x-ray. Um, button batteries are the most scary. Um, they, we will, I'll show you, I tried to do maybe like a live experiment and then I realized our presentation is only an hour long. So injury, from button batteries can be instantaneous, but really even past two hours can be more severe. So I put this little, um, I, I have a sausage I'll show you, um, and I put button batteries in there. When we get to that section, I'll show you what it looks like and I'll tell you what time I put it in. So you can kind of see how that, um, how that damage happens. Magnets, we'll talk about sharp pointed objects. So those, um, those nails and um, um, and whatnot, you know, things that we'll I'll show you pictures of as well. And then food impactions. So, towards the end of the presentation, if you're eating lunch or you get queasy, I'll tell you when you should probably look away for a few minutes. It might be not the most um, great thing to look at. And then, um, and so those are you know, those are the the things that we kind of loop into for foreign bodies. So. Peak ingestions or incidence is usually between six months and primarily three or four years. Really, six years um, is kind of that long range um, of um, foreign body ingestions that were not intentional. Um, and the majority of the time, so 80 
to 90% of the things that kids swallow will reach the stomach and get passed. So it'll get passed into that small intestine. It'll get passed into the colon that we talked about and it'll be pooped out. So that's what happens the majority of the time. Um, 10 to 20% of the time um, requires a non-operative intervention. So that's what GI does. We are the ones that remove it and it's considered non-operative. 1% um, or less of the time surgery is needed. Um, and so we get help from our colleagues then. Uh, what's kind of a fun fact. So mean GI transit time for a foreign body to pass in children is about three and a half days. If it's something that's already passed the stomach, we might give them some, some um, help like Miralax or a stimulant, um, a stool softener to help things pass faster, but it takes about three days. So um, management, um, we talked about this already. So this is also very similar to this uh, caustic ingestions, right? Refusal to eat, drooling, choking, um, vomiting, spitting up, um, chest or throat pain, any like respiratory issues, um, and then duration of time since the ingestion. So sometimes we know, right? If we know that a child is playing with, a, with small balls or playing with a certain toy, um, when they're under supervision, then we might know the time that it's ingested. Oftentimes we don't until the child is ha having some symptoms. And some of those symptoms can be instantaneous too. Um, it's important we always ask what time they ate um, or drank last, um, but in cases of emergent removals, like for example, those button batteries, we bypass that. It doesn't matter, we take it out anyways, uh, regardless of the last time they ate or drank. We do an x-ray to see what type of object this is, where it's located. We ask if there's any past medical history, like there are certain GI diseases that predispose you to have narrowing in your esophagus. And so if you have that, then maybe things will get stuck um, more frequently. Um, and then, you know, if someone knows they ingested something and it's been over 24 hours and they still don't feel right, we do, um, you know, we do an x-ray, they come, they eventually come in, we do an x-ray and it's been, if it's been more than 24 hours, that should definitely be removed as well. So this is a long table. You do not need to know this. This is just kind of to show you what our thought process is when we get a call um, about a foreign body ingestion. So we need to know where it is, right? So the x-ray is going to help us. Is it in the esophagus? Is it in the stomach? Has it already passed the stomach and is in the small intestine. Um, and so in the esophagus, disc batteries, button batteries, um, or very sharp objects in the esophagus, that is an emergent retrieval, removal. Um, uh, other foreign bodies like a coin, I'll show y'all pictures of, um, that can be an urgent retrieval um, if they are very symptomatic and um, it's causing any kind of distress, we will emergently remove that as well. Stomach. Um, it depends. So if things are very sharp, so longer than five centimeters or wide, um, greater than two centimeters in diameter, those things will likely not pass. And so that doesn't mean it has to be an emergent over the night, you know, we come in and remove it, but we'll probably remove it that next morning. Um, and then things that are smaller than that, they can be electively removed um, or the patient can be observed for a few weeks to see if they have that spontaneous passage of that foreign body. And then in the small intestine, um, depending on what it is, we, um, if it's, uh, if it's something that's very sharp or if it looks like it's stuck, it hasn't moved in a while. And if we've done some serial x-rays, you know, every week and it hasn't moved, then we'll definitely try to get it out. Um, we will also, if it hasn't moved, consult our surgery team because we can't get into a lot of the um, areas of the small intestine. The only place we really can get into is the end of the small intestine, beginning of that colon. So right, right at that intersection, we can get into that usually. Otherwise, um, we need our surgeon's help for that. So where in the GI tract are the most common foreign body impactions? Well, um, that would be the esophagus. And this picture and the arrows that they're pointing to, those are kind of these anatomical places that are either really curved, right? Like that duodenal area right here, or have it like a physiologic narrowing. Um, so including the upper esophagus where things can get stuck. So 
Um, if in the stomach, it will likely pass through, unless we talked about this, wider than two centimeters, longer than five. Um, that duodenal C loop right here, that's where some long, sharp things can get stuck. Um, and then the TIIC valve, that is this area right here where that connection between the small intestine and the large intestine happens. That's another place where large, long, sharp things can get stuck. These are some pictures I have um, from a few colleagues and the ones that I found online that were just um, you know, interesting things kids swallowed and what an x-ray might look like for that. So the first one is a toddler with a jingle bell. Um, Christmas time, you can kind of see that outline right here. This is, um, so this is an x-ray. This is the esophagus here. This is the heart. Um, these are the lungs um, and the rib cage uh, right here. And so this is, you know, this is stuck in the esophagus, um, in that upper part of the esophagus. This was a 16 month old that swallowed this object and you can pretty clearly see what that is. That is SpongeBob um, and it's a charm that they swallowed and that was stuck in the kiddo's esophagus too. This was a battleship that was, um, that was stuck in the esophagus, it was not able to pass into the stomach, so it needed to have um, removal as well. This was something I removed last month when I was on service. Um, this kiddo swallowed a strap of their glasses. So it's like the, or mom's glasses, um, I should say. So this goes behind your ear. Um, it gets the end of your glasses. So when you remove your glasses, they can kind of dangle. And it was pretty long. Um, and so I don't know how this happened, but they swallowed it. Um, and when we got the initial x-ray, it looks like it was in the stomach. Um, by the time we got in there, it was already past the stomach in the duodenum, but thankfully we were able to get it before it passed any further. So this was a scorpion charm that a kiddo swallowed. And then um, this was one of those kind of old school games, uh, game pieces um, that someone swallowed that was, you know, embedded in the esophagus. And so what you're noticing probably is a lot of these objects are swallowed when they're, when they're stuck, they're in the upper esophagus. So that, that you can see the clavicles right here, these are, are, are clavicles. And so that's where that physiologic normal narrowing is in the upper esophagus that things can get stuck. Okay. So we'll get into coins. I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, so coins are the most common foreign body that gets stuck. The thing that you see on an x-ray, um, because of anatomy, when a coin is stuck, it's usually this way. It's not this way that it gets stuck. When you're doing an x-ray, um, that is from the front. And so you can see that ring of a coin. Um, if, they're, if they're inverted like this, where they look like there might be sideways, then we worry that it's not in the esophagus, but if it but it is in, uh, might be in the respiratory tract, like the trachea. Um, this one, in fact, was still in the esophagus. Um, um, and so, you know, you, you never know, but you definitely want to be prepared for wherever these are stuck. Um, and so we really rely on our radiology friends to be able to tell us maybe how large an object is. They are able to measure this and they know common uh, measurements of these common coins. This is a picture of a coin that we had, penny that we had last month too that we removed. This penny is sitting in the esophagus. And this is kind of how we remove them. We have so that flexible noodle scope that we use. We have um, an area where we can feed in um, another part that is able to, to be then used as a um, mechanism to take these out. So this is like a rat tooth um, that goes next to the foreign body, it opens up, you're able to clip it down, hold it tight, and you're able to remove that whole foreign body. Um, so the, prim the majority of foreign bodies that are ingested are pennies, um, and then followed by, you know, quarters, nickels, you know, half dollars we don't really have, so those are not very common. Um, and these are all the different types of things that we can attached to our scope to be able to remove things. So this, the first kind of looked like a net. Um, and so if you have like a small ball or something that can be placed on top or even a penny that can be placed on top, scooped up, wrapped around it and removed. And then on the right side here are those like, those like um, alligator rat tooth or alligator um, attachments that are able to open, 
grasp on it and then we can pull it out. Complications. So um, if something stays in the esophagus for a long time, that can lead to um, strictures. So narrowing of that esophagus, it can lead to a perforation, which is a hole that gets created um, in the esophagus that can, you know, that can be attached to other parts. So for example, there can be a, an attachment that forms between the esophagus and the, and the respiratory tract, the trachea. And so that's a problem, right? Because that can lead to respiratory issues, respiratory distress, and um, very rarely, but it can lead to death. Um, other management of coins, uh, primarily when a coin is ingested, we find it in the stomach. And so we usually let it pass um, depending on the size and depending on the age of the kiddo. Um, and a majority of kiddos who um, passed the coins, passed them within a few hours, up to six hours, and then the remainder within um, not a full day. All right, we will get to the biggest and most emergent offender, the button battery. And so this was what um, I wanted to talk to y'all the most about. If you get anything out of this talk is button batteries are terrible, they're bad, do not have them in the house. I know it's kind of hard to say because even in my house, I. Um, you know, try to make it known that we do not buy anything with button batteries. They are so dangerous when they're ingested and they can cause life-threatening issues. Um, we recently, this past weekend, um, our scale in the bathroom died and my husband had to change the, but change the battery in it and it was a button battery. So then like over the holiday season, one of our friends um, got my little daughter a ornament, an Olaf ornament. And that ornament um, light it up and it came with a sealed button battery. So button batteries are everywhere. Um, so where else can you find them? I mean, we all have things that have button batteries in them, watches, flashlights. Um, these are hearing aids. Those, those birthday cards that sing to you when you open them, those have button batteries in them. Car garage openers, flameless lights. I mean, they are literally everywhere. Um, and there's been a huge increase in ingestion of these button batteries over the years. Um, so the worst are when they are large, like the bigger bat button batteries, and in kiddos that are less than four years old, because then they just get stuck. Um, and severe burns in that esophagus can happen in just two hours. And so um, the crazy thing is a majority, of, for example, in this study, majority of the bad outcomes were when the button battery was not witnessed. And that's really what happens. The child gets into something, opens a remote, opens a hearing aid, opens a car door, a car door um, opener, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and that's when they find the button battery. So what does it look like? Well, the scary thing is, doesn't this kind of look like the coin that we saw a few slides back? Well, the biggest thing, and if you, I wish I could zoom in more, but it's a round object like the coin. But what you can see right here, I'm not sure if y'all are gonna be able to see this, but there is this like little black rim that you see right here that is called a peripheral ring or halo. And that, just, that, that small change distinguishes a coin that we can maybe leave alone for a few hours versus a button battery that needs emergent removal. Um, and then, and then a side view, we always do a side view. There's this stair step appearance. So you can kind of see where this area is a little bit shorter than the other part of the button battery and go, going back here, you can see that, right? You can see that change right here where there's like a smaller section and then a larger section. And so we can appreciate that on an x-ray and it's really important for our radiologists and our emergency room docs to be able to recognize this as well. And so this is what I wanted to do with y'all. So um, there's a video, you can find this um, on the button battery awareness website on YouTube. This was after 24 hours when the button battery is stuck in the esophagus, but serious burns can occur within two hours. So I did this earlier today. I had, like I told you, I had those button batteries at home um, and I just got like a sausage from my refrigerator. Um, and so I have three different types of button batteries in here. I have two that are considered uh, like old, you know, they stop working and then one that is brand new. And so um, this is what, this is what happened. So the one in the middle, so I'll show y'all. Can you guys tell me, can you see this? Um, if web shadowers can just 
message me and let me know that they're okay. Awesome. So this, I have three, three kind of um, slots right here. There's one, two, three, this middle one here is I put a button battery in um, this morning. So all these were put in this morning. So the it's 12 o'clock. Now I put these in um, at about seven o'clock before I went to get my Moderna second dose of my vaccine uh, for COVID. So um, I'm really excited about that. Um, I was going to tell you all a lot more about that, but we don't have enough time. So, so this, so the middle one um, is a deactivated battery that it was dead. So this is the one that came from my scale and um, you can see it here. I'm going to take it out and you can see it's created obvious changes um, and a burn in my sausage. So this one was, this one was uh, deactivated. So it was not, you know, it was an old one. This one right here that we're going to take out right now that I'll show you is a brand new one. So look, it's, it's almost like embedded into the sausage. Like you can barely, I can barely open it and look what it's done. It's created a hole already in the sausage. And, um, it's, it has terrible, terrible damage, terrible damage to this area. Um, and this other one was, was one that was also deactivated. So it came from my, oh, gross. <laughs> it came from my scale. Um, so this third one, so really the one that was the brand new one did cause the most damage. Yeah, gross. Discarding that as soon as possible. All right. So injury can happen just in just under two hours. Um, you cut, this is what it looks like in the esophagus kind of looks like, you know, what the sausage we looked at, um, has that black, um, damage here. You can see the ulceration. So all of this is, um, an ulcer and pus and, and inflammation that can happen. So removal as soon as possible. It's immediate. If you have somebody or a friend or anybody you think that swallowed a, a button battery, a child, um, if you go to the urgent care, obviously they'll call the pediatric GI or they'll have them transferred to um, an emergency room. But um, but um, you know you can do a few things in between, like give them honey that, that kind of helps coat that area, so um, it doesn't stop the damage, but it can help it. Um, and then removal. So you may have a little bit more time if that button battery is in the stomach instead of that esophagus area um, and the size, depending on how big it is and if the patient's asymptomatic. But I will tell you, a lot of these patients are asymptomatic, meaning they do not have any symptoms. All of these things can happen. Complications if they're left in there. Um, perforation, creating a hole in that esophagus. A fistula is a connection between the esophagus and the trachea, which is terrible. Um, pneumonia, aspiration. So all these things are really serious things that can happen if these button batteries are not removed. Um, and then the way we follow them up is we do imaging like an MRI after the removal um, that, that you can see what the, what the damage is um, kind of from an outside view. Here's some resources, poison control number. I always tell parents have that handy. Um, if you have any questions of any of these ingestions and in kiddos. Okay, we're going a little bit fast, but I wanna get through a few more things. So magnets, so we're not talking about that typical magnet that's on your refrigerator. We are talking about um, these neodymium um, or rare earth magnets um, that are found in some toys and small objects. These magnets have five to 10 times the attractive force of conventional magnets. Um, they are found in these, you know, these like office desk toys that people have. This thing on the on the left is that are those balls where you take one and then you drop it and then the one on the other side goes out. And so like, you know, people have these, I've seen them in offices. Um, and it's really not an issue as much if you ingest one because one can pass. But if you ingest two or more, and look at this majority of these ingestions were two or more of these magnets, then these magnets can attract to one another and they can attract to one another as they pass through different parts of the bowel. And so I'll show y'all, um, for example, this, this was an x-ray finding. And then the other picture is when we went in to try to retrieve it. Um, so this string of magnets, if one of these sides connects to the other and it crosses a different part of the bowel, then you have trapping of that bowel. You can have 
a hole created there. You can have that perforation um, and that can lead to an obstruction in your bowel. I mean, these are very, very serious things. So just like button batteries, multiple high powered magnets need to be removed. Um, right, so one magnet can be watched. You, you, we, can, we can usually let them pass. Um, these are all the things, necrosis, so ulcerations, these are all kind of fancy long words for a lot of really serious troubling things and they may require emergent surgery. So if they, if it looks like it's past the stomach, we absolutely contact our surgery team um, to help with removal of these. Sharp things. So this includes like sharp toys, pins, hair clips, um, those thumbtacks, uh, bones, you know, people that are eating some kind of fish or um, a chicken wing or something, they can um, accidentally ingest these small, small bones. Um, and they, they can be removed urgently if there's a high risk of them creating a hole. Um, but like I said, you know, that those measurements mat matter. So if it's something little that has this type of um, blunt end to it, we might be able to have them pass, but if it's long, longer than that five centimeter rule, it's gonna have a lot of trouble passing through that C loop of the duodenum. Um, so the thing is with these types of foreign bodies, 100% of metallic objects are seen on an X-ray. If this sharp foreign um, object is made of glass, then only 43% of the time can we see them on an X-ray. If it's um, a fish bone, then only 26%. And if it's made out of wood, like a toothpick, we will not see them on x-ray. And so if the x-ray is negative, but there's a high suspicion that someone did in fact um, swallow a toothpick or a suspected foreign body, then you, we will still proceed with that um, initial look with our scope to see if we can see it and take it out. Um, this patient that this was published in, um, this was not one of my patients. This um, was an older, adult, I mean, well, older 36 year old adult that swallowed multiple long, sharp things. So in A there, that is a, um, that is a toothbrush. Um, B looks like maybe, I don't know, fork or something, um, or, or like a pen, or I'm not sure what that is. And then C is obviously a pencil and you can see all of those things are removed, um, endoscopically and endoscopically. All of these complications, we we have already seen them. These are not new, but you might wonder like, how do we get these sharp things out, right? Well, we have this special attachment that attaches to our scope. It's like this, it's a hood essentially. And, um, and it goes on top of the scope, the scope. And then this hood actually gets flipped over before we insert it. Um, so it's, it's flipped over, like you can see in, in B. And so it, passes smoothly until we see the object. And then we usually have another attachment that can grab this object close to our scope. And as we pass back from the stomach to the esophagus, this hood will flip back on itself so that it protects the esophagus when the sharp object goes back up and through the mouth in the upper respiratory area. All right, we have four minutes left. So. The, these are, I didn't put the picture up right away because I wanted to give y'all a heads up. These are, I'm going to talk about the food impactions now. This is the last thing that we'll talk about. So if this make, this might make you queasy, you can, you know, look away, whatever. But these are things that we see. We especially see these food impactions in folks that might have like a GI esophageal disease that might not know about it and that they might eat things like chicken, beef, pork. Those are the most common offenders, and the, these food um, bites get stuck in the esophagus. So look away if this is going to gross you out. Um, this is meat that was stuck in someone's esophagus and could not pass through. So like I said, some people might have a disease, like for example, eosinophilic esophagitis is an allergic disease that happens in the esophagus and it creates narrowing in the esophagus. And so when patients try to eat something, um, like meat that's not chewed well, that can get stuck. All right. Um, in the loo time, we'll just kind of zoom past this a little bit. So how do we get these um, food impactions out? There are multiple attachments that we can have in that um, flexible noodle that we use. Um, this might take a long time to get out. Sometimes it just breaks up, right? Like kind of gross, but 
it can take a long time for it to be removed little by little every time. And then after removal, this is what we see. See, the esophagus wants to be nice and smooth without these rings or ridges. And in certain diseases like EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis, if it's not treated, that can cause these strictures and these narrowings that might predispose somebody to getting something stuck in there. Um, these are certain different types that we, of things that we can use. This is the net that can engulf kind of the um, foreign body and then take it out if it's the food impaction. All right, two minutes, one minute. Um, advice for future physicians. I think the biggest advice I have is find a specialty that you love, that keeps you interested in it, whether it's at 3 p.m. on a normal work day or 3 a.m. You know, some of these, some of these ingestions, especially the emergent ones, we come in in the middle of the night if we're on call to get them removed. And so if you find that specialty is still driving you, that's when you know that it's the right one for you. And so find something that you love, love doing, um, and that's going to keep you interested. Um, and if that is in fact pediatric GI, let me know. I can talk about this all day long. So thanks y'all so much for attending. You can always reach out to me um, um, through Instagram. And if I don't check it right away, I apologize. If I read it in clinic and then things get lost, just message me again. I, I have no problem with double messaging. <laughs> Eventually I will answer. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Schertz. Everybody okay. loved the at-home experiment. I mean, experiment that you did. That was so cool. And it really helped us visualize how dangerous the button batteries yes. are. Yes. Um, everyone, please make sure you check her out on social media. Her Instagram is gastrodoc.md and feel free to reach out to her. And thank you guys all so much for attending. The link to the Google form is now posted in the live chat and it will also be in the description as soon as the live stream ends. Thank you all so much for attending. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Schertz. You're welcome. Bye y'all.